church family, I invite you to open up in your Bibles to Genesis. Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 26. I'm going to read that in just a moment. You can remain seated while I read. We're going to read all of Genesis chapter 4 uh, together. I'm going to read. You follow along in your copy of God's Word. The title of our message today is God's Faithfulness in a World of Sin. God's Faithfulness in a World of Sin. Genesis chapter 4. God's word says this, Now Adam knew his wife, Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock, and of their fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then, then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name, the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad fathered Mehujael, and Mehujael fathered Methushael, and Methushael fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other Zillah. Ada bore Jabal, and he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth, for she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord for his church today. God's faithfulness in a world of sin. We have a problem. We have a problem, and by we, I mean humanity. And by humanity, I mean you and me and everyone else in the world. We've got a problem, and our problem boils down to a failure to do the very thing God created us to do. And that thing is to worship God. Our problem is not that we fail to worship. Catch this. Our problem is not that we fail to worship. Every one of us worships all day long, every day long. Every person in the world worships all day long and every day long. Our problem is not that we fail to worship. Our problem is that we fail to worship God. When the Apostle Paul summarized the problem of humanity in Romans chapter 1, he described it as a problem of worship. He said that we have exchanged the truth about God for a lie and have worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. And because worship begins in the heart, the heart of our problem is, church family, a 
problem of the heart. The heart of our problem is a problem of the heart. Our biggest problem is not that we do bad things, but that our hearts worship someone or something other than God. Now, that doesn't excuse our bad actions, our sinful actions. Paul goes on to say in Romans 1 that this worship problem of our hearts has manifested itself in lifestyles of sinful actions. A few verses later in Romans 1, he writes this, And since they, that's those who have, have rebelled against worshiping God and are worshiping the creature rather than the, cre the creator, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. That is God's indictment through the Apostle Paul of the human race. We have a worship problem that shows itself through acts of sin. Now, this problem was not unique to Rome in the first century A.D. This problem of the human heart traces itself all the way back to the Garden of Eden when Eve listened to the serpent, Adam listened to Eve, neither of them listened to God. In that moment, sin took root in their hearts and they passed that worship problem, that sin problem, down to every generation of humanity since then, beginning with their own children. In fact, the Bible's description of Adam and Eve's children and their children and their children and their children reveal how quickly sin destroyed the hearts of humanity and pushed us away from worshiping God. So much so that we can't even get past the second generation of humanity before we see willful rebellion against God. Just outright willful rebellion. And by the time we get to the seventh generation of humanity, we not only see willful rebellion, uh, disobedience to God, willful sin, we see the celebration of willful rebellion against God. But as is always the case with God, we not only see humanity's rebellion, but we also see God's faithfulness. As we study chapter 4 of Genesis, I believe we learn this, church. Because sin has taken root in our hearts, God's faithfulness to His promise is our only hope of becoming worshipers of God. Because sin has taken root in our hearts. We are born sinners. God's faithfulness to His promise of deliverance is our only hope of becoming what God created us to be. And that is worshipers of Him. Because our greatest problem is that we fail to worship God as He deserves. Our greatest need in life is that we would be restored to a place where we can worship the one true God. In fact, this is the storyline of the whole Bible. In the beginning, God created a world where humans worshipped Him and Him alone. But as we said, when faced with temptation, they chose not to worship God. And then through the rest of the pages of Scripture, we see how God has worked in spite of the wickedness of humanity to restore a people back to Himself, to redeem a people from their rebellion and to change their hearts such that one day, one day, there will be people from every tribe, language, nation, and people group around the throne of God doing what God created them to do, worshiping Him forever and ever. And God will get all the glory because it's His faithfulness to His promise of deliverance that will have done it. A couple of weeks ago, we focused in on the second son of Adam and Eve, whose name was Abel. And we saw in Abel not merely the example of a faithful worshiper, but one who points us to Jesus, who shed his blood to rescue our rebellious hearts. Today, I want us to focus our attention more upon Adam and Eve's first son, Cain, and then Cain's descendants. I want to walk us through chapter 4 in three kind of large sections. We'll spend most of the time in section 1, where we see that we have a problem. 
That's verses 1 through 16. And then in section 2, we'll see that we are not the solution to the problem. That's verses 17 through 24. And then we'll close with verses 25 through 26, and we'll see that God provides the solution to our heart's problem, the solution that we need. Let's begin with the fact that we have a problem. Church family, truth number one today is this. When sin rules our hearts, we fail to worship God, and we are cursed. We're cursed. When sin rules our hearts, we fail to worship God and are cursed. Chapter 4 tells us that Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. Now we can stop right there, and that's, that's reason to give God glory. That's reason to give thanks for God's grace. Remember chapter 3 closed, closed with Adam and Eve being kicked out of the garden, but not before Adam named his wife Eve, which means the mother of all living, in anticipation of her giving birth to an offspring who God had promised would deliver them from the serpent, would deliver humanity from the serpent. We see God now providing Adam and Eve with children. And that's a blessing. Eve says, that, um, says as much when she names Cain. She says, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. She credits God with giving her children. But unfortunately, Adam and Eve passed along their sin, their, their rebellious hearts to their children. Now, Abel, the text tells us, was a keeper of sheep. He was a shepherd. Uh, Cain was a worker of the ground. He he farmed the ground. He grew crops. And they both brought a sacrifice to the Lord. The text tells us that Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And so we see both brothers attempting to worship God. Both brothers here are attempting to offer worship to God. However, we learn in verse 4 and 5, that the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. In other words, he rejected it. He did not accept Cain's offering, but he did accept Abel's. So what's the deal? What's the deal? I mean, come on, God. Both of them are attempting to worship you. Both took time out of their day. Both took time away from their jobs. Both took time to offer an act of worship to you, God. Why did you accept Abel's and not Cain's? I don't think that it was because of the type of offering they brought. We see in the Levitical law that God instructed his people to bring animal sacrifices at certain times and grain sacrifices. That's uh, uh, sacrifices that grew up out of the ground. And so both of those are sacrifices that at their appropriate times the Lord Lord receives and accepts. I don't think it's exactly what they brought. It could be that Abel brought the best he had. The text does say that he brought the firstborn, while Abel brought some of the fruits instead of the first fruits. The text says firstborn of the flock that Abel brought, but it doesn't say that Cain brought the first fruit. So it could be that. But even if that was part of the problem, I don't think it was the heart of the problem. Because I think the heart of the problem was a problem of the heart. The heart of their problem was a problem of Cain's problem was a problem of the heart. The problem was Cain's worship was merely external. He performed an act of worship outwardly, while inwardly his heart was not worshiping God. And we see this clearly at the end of verse 5, which says, So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. Friends, an angry heart toward God, an angry heart toward a fellow human, is not a heart that is worshiping God. And this hardness of heart toward God and his brother is further laid out in the rest of God's interaction with Cain and Cain's interaction with his brother. As we look carefully at these verses, we learn some important truths about worship. I want to share a few of those with you. The first is a very important truth that we see here, and then we see it all throughout the rest of God's word, and that's this, church family. God rejects acts of worship that do not come from hearts of worship. God rejects acts of worship which do not come from hearts of worship. I want to get right to some application here. You can pretend to worship God. You might even fool others into thinking you are worshiping God. You might fool yourself into thinking you are worshiping God. But God knows your heart. God knows my heart. You can attend church services. You can sing worship songs. You can read your Bible. You can pray. You can be try to be kind to others. All the while, God is rejecting your acts of worship because they are merely just acts. 
The acts of worship are not flowing from a heart of worship. And if our worship of God goes no deeper than outward displays of worship, our worship can only be classified as pretend. It's not real. It's fake. And we might be able to fool one another, we might be able to fool ourselves, but no one has ever fooled God with fake or pretend worship. Many years after Cain's fake worship, the Lord chastised the people of Israel through the prophet Isaiah when he said this. He said, this people, this is God speaking, this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips while their hearts are full far from me it is very possible friends it is very possible to engage in acts of worship while having hearts that are far from god i think it would behoove us all and i include myself in this to do a little heart check this morning, to ask God to examine our hearts and see if there be any grievous way in us. Another thing we learn about worship is that because of sin, there is a worship battle raging in our hearts. You say, well, well I'll just worship God with my heart. And it's, I'll, just, I'll just choose to do that. It's not that easy. <laughs> It's not that easy because there is a worship battle raging in our hearts because of sin. Notice what God says to Cain in verse 6. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. There's a worship battle raging in the heart of Cain. There's a worship battle raging in our hearts today. The reality of sin given in this passage could not be clearer. The danger of sin could not be clear. Sin is compared to a predator lying in wait, ready to pounce as soon as we let down our guard. Sin wants to overtake us and reign over us, but God says we must rule over it. Church family, every day, every moment of every day, there's a worship battle raging in our hearts. I want you to imagine for just a moment that your heart has a throne on it. Just imagine that your, your heart is a throne room and it has a throne on your heart. Whoever or whatever is sitting on the throne of your heart is what is ruling over you. It's what you worship. It is your God. Now let me ask a question for us today. Who is the rightful ruler of our hearts? Who deserves to rule and reign over our lives? I think we would say, I hope that we would all say, God. God and God alone. He alone is worthy of our worship, and that is the right answer. But sin is crouching at the throne room door. It is every moment of every day, it's there crouching at the throne room door. Our fleshly desires, our selfish desires, our sinful desires are constantly trying to storm the door and take control of our hearts. James, the brother of Jesus and a pillar of the church in Jerusalem, warned Christians of this battle for our hearts when he said in James chapter 4, verse 1, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? It's James chapter 4, verse 1. See, every time we are faced with a choice to honor God or to go our own way, the choice we... Uh, we make comes down to whether or not God is on the throne of our heart or whether sinful desire has crept in, sprang into action, and taken God's rightful place. I wonder today who or what is winning the worship battle of your heart. Who or what is winning the worship battle of my heart? Who is it? What is it? Are you bowing down to a personal preference? Are you bowing down to a man-made tradition? Are you bowing down to resentment or bitterness? Are you bowing down to peer pressure? Are you bowing down to selfish desire for ease and comfort? Are you bowing down to lustful thoughts? You fill in the blank. Or are you bowing down to Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Are you worshiping Him with joyful obedience? Or are you just going through the motions 
pretending to worship him because really there is something else or someone else that is winning the worship battle that is raging for the throne of your heart today. Whatever it is that's on the throne of your heart, if it's not Jesus, it's sin. It's sin. And there's another truth we notice concerning worship here in this passage, and it's this, that our failure to worship God then reveals itself in a failure to love others. Our, our failure to worship God then, then reveals itself in a failure to love others. Remember a minute ago we were in Romans 1 and Paul said, our greatest problem is a, is a worship problem, but then that manifests itself in our, in our actions towards other people. We see the exact same thing happening here with Cain and Abel. See, our worship of God, our failure to worship God, not only impacts our relationship with God, but it impacts our relationship with those around us. Notice what happens when Cain fails to rule over sin, but instead allows sin to rule over his heart, pushing God off the throne. Verse 8 says this, and then following, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your, uh, Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, and now you're cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive, a wanderer on the earth. Church, when sin rules our hearts, sin then characterizes our choices. Every word that we speak, every action that we take, flows forth from our hearts. When sin characterizes our uh, reigns in our hearts, rules in our hearts, sin then characterizes our choices. Sin ruled in Cain's heart, and the result was that he chose to murder his brother. Remember that verse from James that I just read? Why do you fight and quarrel, James says? He, he, he roots the worship war in the context of quarreling among people, of a lack of love between the relationship between people. Is, not your, is it not your passions that are at war within you? So please see this. Please understand this. The heart of the problem is always a problem of our hearts. That's true when it comes to breakdowns in our relationship with God, and it's true when it comes and the breakdowns in our relationships with other people. The problem is a problem of our hearts. Our failure to worship God reveals itself in our failure to love others. So friend, if you're aware of a lack of love today, a lack of love toward others in your life. Maybe it's bitterness or hate, resentment, harsh words, negative comments directed towards one person or many people. If you're convicted of a failure to love others well, then you need to know, God wants you to know, He wants me to know that that problem goes deeper than just your relationship with that person. Your lack of love towards others is merely the symptom of your failure to worship God. You know, the same is true in my life. My lack of love towards others is a symptom of my failure to worship God. And if that's us today, if that's you, if that's me, then we need to ask God to help us identify what it is that is sitting on the throne of our hearts And you need to ask Him to help you fix the worship worship problem in your heart. And then, and only then, we'd be able to work on showing love to those around you. Or we could state it more positively. One of the benefits, one of the benefits of genuinely worshiping God from a heart of joyful submission is that you will find yourself doing a better and better job of loving those around you. Do you want to love your spouse better? Then grow in your worship of God. You want to love your parents or your children better? Then grow in your worship of God. You want to love your neighbor better? Then grow in your worship of God. You want to love your fellow church member better? Then grow in your worship of God. You want to love the lost in our world better? Then grow in your worship of God. The Apostle John wrote a letter to Christians encouraging them to have confidence in their eternal life by examining the evidence of salvation in their lives. And he gave three main evidences that a person has been saved. They boil down to this, right doctrine. Do you believe what is true about Jesus? 
right action? Do you live in obedience to God's commands and right love? Do you love others, not only in word and talk, but in action and in truth? And when he speaks about the test of love, do you know the example that he gives of someone whose lack of love proved that his heart belonged to Satan rather than to God? He went all the way back to Genesis chapter 4. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11 through 12 says this. John writes, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. You see, Cain's lack of love was proof that his heart did not belong to God. Oh, he came with outward acts of worship, but he was belonging to the evil one the whole time. He was pretending to worship God. He had a worship problem, and it resulted in a love problem. And I wonder, I wonder if perhaps that's you today. And we see the result of this was that Cain was cursed. He was cursed. Very clearly, God says, and now you are cursed. But there's one more thing we need to notice about sin ruling our hearts and our failure to worship God, and that's this, that hearts hardened by sin walk away from worshiping God despite his kindness. This is one of the, just the ugly truths about sin. That when we just let sin rule in our hearts, it hardens our hearts, and we won't even respond to the kindness of God with love and worship for God. Cain was still only concerned about himself after God cursed him. He just murdered his brother, and he's over there complaining that somebody's going to kill him. Verse 13, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Oh, really, Cain? Sorry, that was my words. That wasn't God's word. I'll get back to God's word. Behold, Cain says, you have driven me today away from the ground. And from your face I shall be hid. Now I'm going to be a fugitive, a wanderer on the earth. Whoever finds me is going to kill me. This is, where, this, is where, this is where I recognize how unholy I am compared to a holy God. And the fact that God shows so much kindness to Cain right here. Doesn't mean that he saves Cain from his sin, but he does show kindness. I would have been like, Cain, shut your trap. You're done. What, what does God say? He says, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. The Lord put a mark on Cain, lest anyone who found him should attack him. And Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. This is incredibly amazing and incredibly sad. Cain is only concerned now that he's going to be killed, but God shows him this act of kindness by placing a mark of protection on him. Now, we don't know what this mark was. It doesn't really matter what the mark was. What matters is that God promised to protect Cain for the rest of his life on this earth. God showed him kindness, but what does the next line say? Cain walked away from the presence of the Lord. Sin has taken such a grip on his heart that even he cannot respond to the kindness of the Lord. Friend, sin, if allowed to take root and grow, will ultimately destroy you by driving you so far from God that you won't even respond to the kindness that God shows you. Another verse in the book of James says this, but each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. We see the progression of sin as it takes root in our hearts. And my plea to you today is that there is sin in your heart. If there's a worship problem in your heart today, please don't walk away from God's kindness unchanged. God is showing you kindness today by confronting you and giving you an opportunity to repent. And so don't harden your heart. Choose to do what is right by worshiping God through repenting of your sin and then trusting in Jesus Christ alone to rescue you from your sin, to change your heart and to give you a heart of worship towards God. When sin rules our hearts, we fail to worship God and we are cursed. Church, we got a problem. It's a heart problem. We need a solution. But what comes next helps us know at least one thing that is not the solution to the problem, but it's something that we often run to, and that is ourselves. That is ourselves. The truth we will learn from the second section of chapter 4 is this, 
Advancements in human civilization will not change our hearts. Advancements in human civilization will not change our hearts. The story of Cain is pretty much over, except for one thing. Verse 17 tells us that Cain had a son. He named his son Enoch, and then the text goes on to tell us that Enoch had a son. And he had a son, and he had a son, and eventually there's a son named Lamech. And as we look at the descendants of Cain, we're given a few details, and I think we can boil these details down to two things, okay? Two things that we see in the details of Cain's descendants. These details tell us, number one, human civilization was advancing. Human civilization was advancing, and number two, human hearts were at the same time sinking further and further and further into sin. We see a city being built in verse 17. Then in verse 19, the text zooms in on Lamech, and we see Lamech directly violate God's creation order by stepping outside of God's design and boundaries for marriage and practicing polygamy. Verse 19 says, Lamech had two wives. The name of one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah. And then we see more human achievement more advancement of human civilization. Verse 20 through 22 tells us that Adab or Jabal, and he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. Okay, this wasn't just, it's not talking about just some kind of lone farmer. It's talking about the agricultural practices. An advancement in human civilization. His brother's name was Jubal, and he was the father of all those who play the lyre and the harp. So advancement in the arts. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron, advancement in technology and industry. It seems like humanity is progressing, but sin is still reigning in human hearts, and societal progress is not going to change those hearts. The text highlights this man named Lamech, who we already know is a polygamist. He practiced polygamy. But then we learn that he is a murderer like his great, great, great-grandfather Cain, except this time, instead of trying in a way to deny his sin or at least overlook it like Cain did when Cain said, oh, I don't know where he's at. Am I my brother's keeper? Lamech doesn't just try to overlook it or ignore it. He writes a song bragging about his sin to his wives. Verse 23 and verse 24 is not a confession. It is a celebration of his sin. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I have to say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. Those words are poetry. We know that from the Hebrew, the way it's written. It's like he's singing a song bragging about murdering a young man for wounding him. And the way this poem is written in the Hebrew, I don't got to get into the details, but the way it's written in the Hebrew, the emphasis throughout this poem is on the word my. The song is all about him. It's all about him. In other words, Lamech's song is all about himself, not about God. It's all about his sin, not about his holiness. He's not at all ashamed of his sin. In fact, he's bragging about it. He is celebrating his sin. If we notice, something is missing in the description of Cain's descendants. From verse 17 through verse 24, what is missing in all of that is God. What's missing in all of that is God. So what is God wanting us to see in these first seven generations of humanity? Well, I think he wants us to see that sin is spreading and hearts are darkening despite the advancements in human civilization. A city is built, but polygamy is practiced. Humans learn to manage livestock, learn to appreciate the arts, and learn to make metal goods, the industry, but murder is celebrated. The problem of the heart is still there. The point is not to say that advancements in technology and other human achievements are inherently bad. In fact, we see in Scripture that those things can be very good and God uses those things for His glory. The point is that our hearts are wicked and nothing we can do as humans can slow down, much less stop, the spread of sin in human hearts. 
Many in our society today worship human achievement, worship advancement in technology. They call this human progress, and they think that's going to fix the problem of humanity. In one sense, it is progress. For example, it is scientific and engineering progress to say that we can launch people into outer space and bring them back safely. That's pretty incredible. I don't think I'm going to sign up to go, but I love watching it on TV. But it doesn't matter how deep into space we can travel, the depth of our sin is not alleviated by space exploration or any other human achievement. We might be able to do heart transplants in a doctor's office, in a surgical room, but no amount of medical progress will ever fix the spiritual condition of the human heart. We need something more than our own efforts to change our hearts. We need God to do what only he can do. By the time we get to the end of verse 24, humanity seems to be plunging, plunging so far into sin that all hope is lost. But praise God, God has made a promise. God promised in Genesis 3.15 to send an offspring who would destroy the serpent and thus deliver God's people. There seems to be a problem though here. If deliverance will come through an offspring of woman, there seems to be this problem. Eve has two sons. One has been murdered, and the other is the convicted murderer who's been cursed by God and whose descendants don't seem to be any better than him. In fact, they seem to be worse than he was. And so are we back to being in a place where all hope is lost? No, because God is sovereign. He's sovereign over the sin that's spreading throughout humanity. When God steps in, when God intervenes, there is hope that sinners can become genuine worshipers of God. And that's the truth we see in this final section, in these final couple of verses of chapter 4. The truth is this, that God's faithfulness to His promise of deliverance turns hearts back to Him. God's faithfulness to His promise of deliverance has the power to turn hearts back to Him. Remember, our hearts are ruled by sin. We fail to worship God. Human achievement can't fix the problem of our hearts. But human depravity, church, cannot stop God's plan to change human hearts. Verse 25 says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son, and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another, catch the word, offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. You see, it see, seems that Eve understood at this point the difference between her two sons. She understood, as we studied a couple of weeks ago, that Abel was a faithful worshiper, and she probably had hopes that he would be the promised deliverer. She also understands now that Cain belonged to the evil one, and so he could not be the one to destroy the evil one. But Abel's not here anymore. Cain has killed him. There's enmity, as God had promised, between the woman and the serpent between her offspring and his offspring. But God replaced Abel with Seth. That word offspring or seed should immediately take us back to the promise God made in chapter 3, verse 15. Eve was holding on to God's promise. Eve was believing that God would send that promised offspring to provide deliverance. And Eve credited God with the birth of Seth. Remember we said all that talk about Cain's descendants, no mention of God. But now we step out of his lineage, his ancestry, that those descendants, of the, the ones who came before Lamech all the way back to Cain, we step away from that and Eve says, God, God has now stepped in. To Seth then also was born a son and he called his name Enosh. At that time, verse 26, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So when God steps in, when God acts, the result is that people begin to worship him. The earth at this point is filled with people refusing to worship God, but God steps in with this offspring, and the result is that people begin to worship Him. Now, does that mean that Seth was the ultimate fulfillment of God's promise in chapter 3, verse 15? No. Seth didn't destroy the serpent. But, but, he was evidence that God had not given up on His promise. Here was evidence that God was remaining faithful to His promise even when humanity was rebelling against Him. You see, all of Cain's descendants ended up dying in God's judgment through a global flood. All of Cain's descendants died. But Seth had a descendant named Noah who survived. And Noah had a descendant 
named Jesus, who was and is the Son of God, who came to destroy the works of the devil and to replace our hearts of flesh, the Bible says, with hearts of, uh, of, of excuse me, the hearts of stone with hearts of flesh. He came to replace our hearts of stone with hearts of flesh. In other words, he came to soften the hardness of our hearts so that we could respond to the loving kindness of God. Jesus came and died on the cross to take the punishment for our failure to worship God so that we could be redeemed and restored and once again become worshipers of the Most High God. Friends, it is good news. Perhaps you need to hear this today. In fact, I think we all do. It's good news that God has appointed another offspring. It's good news that He, this offspring, died for our sin and rose from the dead. And it's good news that all who repent of their sin and believe in Him for salvation have the curse lifted, have the sin of their hearts forgiven, and get to share in the eternal joy of worshiping God forever and ever, starting right now here in this place. And so I ask you, where is your heart today? Where is it? Are you a worshiper of the one true God? Not because you've mastered sin yourself, but because you are believing in the one who has mastered sin and Satan and death for you. Do you worship God through Jesus? Or are you a pretender? Are you a fake worshiper? Is your heart hard toward the things of God? The answer is not to trust in any human achievement. Nothing that you have done, are doing, or will ever do. But to trust in the achievement of Jesus who purchased your salvation. Only God's faithfulness to his promise of deliverance can turn our hearts back to him. Only church through Jesus can we have hearts of worship. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that despite our failure to worship you, despite the the depth of our sin that has taken root in our hearts, Father, despite the hardness of our hearts even towards your kindness, you have provided Jesus who rescues our hearts God, our deepest problem is a problem of the heart, but that's exactly what Jesus came to fix. He came to fix our hearts. He came to overthrow whatever sin had crept in and taken over the throne of our hearts. And God, today, anyone who believes in Jesus Christ for salvation, your word promises, your word promises, that you will come right back in to the throne of their hearts and Jesus will take his rightful place. You will turn that heart of stone to a heart of flesh and you will rule and reign over that person's life. God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the cross. God, give us hearts of worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.